tonight. And joining me on the panel with this very rowdy crowd, performer and writer Steph Tisdall, Shadow Minister for Aged Care Services Claire O'Neill, Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs Gideon Rosner, National Political Editor for News.com.au Samantha Maiden, and live from Canberra, Minister for Families, Social Services and Women's Safety Anne Rustin. Please make them all very welcome. The Prime Minister is being assailed from within. In the recent past, his political allies have said they have never trusted him. They have accused him of sexism and racism, and women from within his party have accused him of being menacing and controlling, and described him as a person who lacks a moral compass. His former rival for the seat of Cook has eviscerated him, and his own deputy PM has called him a liar and a hypocrite. Given his party room thinks so little of him, why should women of, of Australia vote for him? Thanks so much for your question, Marley. Well, look, before we get to the politicians, Sam, we might start with you on that. <laughs> well, it's a big challenge for the Prime Minister at the moment, all, all the attacks on him right now. The question goes to women in particular, but it's, it mentions a, a lot of issues that he's having to fend off. Well, it's quite a roll call, but we should say it's not just uh, women who have made some complaints about the Prime Minister. As, as the question noted, the Deputy Prime Minister had some um, rather unkind things to say in that text message. I think that um, Prime Ministers before have copped this sort of criticism. Mean and tricky memo, you remember with John Howard. Very well. Uh, the lying rodent, uh, which was uh, allegedly uh, said by one of uh, John Howard's uh, team <coughs> in the lead-up to the 2014 election. I think what's different this time around is the volume of it. Now, obviously, they will dismiss this and say that these people are disgruntled. I'm sure that Anne will have something to say about that <laughs> shortly. Uh, but it's quite a, uh, a, you know, it's a volume of people. And I think that's the problem that the Prime Minister has got. Because some voters will say, well, if they're, where there's smoke, there's fire. Anne, mm. can I get you to respond to the question? Why should people, or women in particular, vote for the Prime Minister, given all of that? Well, I'm, I, mean, I don't imagine there's anybody that's sitting on the panel tonight, you know, people who are in public life who hasn't had a sledging some time in their career, I sure know that, that I have. Um, but what I, I would say is that, you know, the timing of much of what has come out um, certainly has to be questioned and we should be calling it out for that because, you know, on the eve of an election, we start seeing these things coming out of the woodwork. Um, you know, I would question uh, whether it is actually a, a political hit job. But can I say, I can only speak from my own personal experience. I mean, I've, I've worked with the Prime Minister for 10 years, uh, closely with the Prime Minister for the last three years as uh, in his Cabinet. And I've got to say that the commentary that I have heard by some of these people is just not the Scott Morrison that I know. The Scott Morrison I know is, is the man who, when I asked him, um, you know, for, to make sure that we were supporting, um, you know, with great investment into the next national plan to end violence against women and children, was immediately, um, you know, understood what we needed and was prepared to commit to it. So I can only <coughs> say that the Scott Morrison I know is not the is is a completely different person to some of the things that I've heard in the media of recent times. I'll go to the rest of the panel, but just while I've got you, you mentioned the timing and it being a political hit job, but that actually makes the point, doesn't it? As you're, when you're heading into a hotly contested election, as this one is, when the polls are indicating you've got an opposition that's clearly competitive, the fact that your own would be prepared to come out of the woodwork using their own names, using their own faces and say what they are saying about the Prime Minister actually amplifies the point that they well, are so disenchanted with him. They derail their party's own chances of winning. Well, I mean, unfortunately, when you're the Prime Minister or when you're in any leadership position, you can't say yes and people are disappointed. Um, I suppose I'm very disappointed at the way the disappointed people have responded with some of their public commentary. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, um, sometimes people do make public commentary and it gets picked up and now we're having a conversation about it. But, um, you know, I'm very focused on making sure that I do what the Australian public are expecting of me as a politician and that's looking after their interest and not talking about this kind of stuff. You've spoken, um, Claire O'Neill, about male entitlement in Parliament before and uh, watched this closely. What's your response? I actually don't see it as much from a gender lens, so I haven't worked very closely with the Prime Minister. Um, what I did notice in my electorate was at the last election, I think, you know, Scott Morrison came into the job and he was elected um, as Prime Minister quite soon after. And he seemed to get this staggy dad sort of feel across and a lot of my constituents that I talked to really felt that this is who this person is. And 
the truth is that Scott Morrison is the most strategic politician in the parliament that is really saying something like he is a politician to his absolute core and the thing that really gets me about the conduct I see in parliament is he has a fundamental problem with telling the truth and that's the thing that I can't get over because I know that people think politicians are all lies but Scott Morrison is in a new territory of his own. I see it in Parliament, he stands on his feet and he says, you know, things that are on camera, him saying, you know, months or years ago, he just denies ever saying it and this has just happened again and again and again and we're going into this election context, context. we've got six weeks and I do think it's going to be really hard for Australians to feel that they can put their trust in him to do what he says he, he will do, to not do what he says he won't do again because they've just experienced this now for three years and I do think they've kind of worked out who the man is and, who, and what his character is. Gideon, I'll, I'll take you to the question, but um, interestingly as well, and we should all reflect on this, and uh, Sam, I'd like your view on it too, the fact that Matthew Kamenzuli, the former New South Wales Liberal Party member, he's won special leave from the High Court now to challenge the endorsement of those candidates that were led, championed and, and some might say steamrolled by Alex Hawke and also by the Prime Minister. How's all that going to play out, Gideon? Mm. Look, I think it's another mess, and I think the fact that we're talking about these things in part shows how Scott Morrison has lost control of the agenda, and the reason for that is because he has... Uh, both parties, frankly, have very few things to say about actual policies. Uh, I don't know Scott Morrison. I can't talk to the veracity of these claims. My concern is what Scott Morrison has done to the Liberal Party and to liberalism, to the values that I've subscribed to. Uh, my concern is the fact that the Morrison government has embroiled Australia in a trillion dollar debt, uh, that it's ramped up online censorship, that it um, made it a criminal offence for Australian citizens during the pandemic to re-enter their own country, rendering them stateless. Uh, the, the, the Morrison government engaged in that awful state-sanctioned theft that was robo-debt, uh, I think those are much more important issues to talk to the Prime Minister's character and his judgement and his leadership. And I have to say, Scott Morrison would have to be, in my opinion, uh, the worst Prime Minister the Liberal Party has put up since Billy McMahon, except Billy McMahon had principles. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Aden, you've watched him very closely in the Parliament. Does, uh, is Claire O'Neill gone too far in his description of, of who he is and how he operates? I think that Scott Morrison is a shapeshifter, right? And the criticism of <laughs> Anthony Albanese is that no one knows who he is. I think the problem for Scott Morrison is that everybody does. And, <laughs> you know, Scott Morrison's problem going into this election is 100% Scott Morrison. That's the lead <laughs> in his saddlebags. And, and, I mean, I, I don't mean that to be unkind. It's just a... a, a an observation of mine as a, a political journalist, right? I mean, he had the advantage of the last campaign that he was relatively new. There was a freshness to the government, even though they'd been in, in government for a long time. This time around, you know, he has that triumvirate of issues which is reflected in the news poll when the government has dipped. And each time the dip has been greater, the crater has been greater. The first uh, was, of course, in relation to nicking off to Hawaii and having a holiday while the nation burned. The next was in relation to the allegations of abuse at Parliament House. Once again, the dip in news poll was greater than Hawaii. And finally, the greatest one was uh, the vaccine rollout. Now, each time there has been a recovery, um, but you see now that their primary vote is, is very low. And, yeah, I mean, you, you, you do see it all the time that the Prime Minister will say, oh, I didn't say that, I meant this, or someone asked me this, but I actually meant to say this. Oh, I never said that. And it, it gets a little intriguing. Steph, uh, you used to want to be a politician. I know, what a loser. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steph. Thanks a lot. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's too much. <laughs> no, um, Steph, there's, Steph, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> no, no, I always had this idea that I could uh, enact change in the world, and I, I don't think that politics is where it lies. Mm. Um, because it's polit the politics gets in the way of politics. I think politics is so out of touch with society. I mean, like, I have this dream that we get a panel, like a jury of 12 random people from all around Australia and they help make decisions. Because the whole <laughs> thing is, with, with politicians, you train to become a politician. You know, you spend your life living the experiences that an a person who wants to be a politician lives. It's like, you know, nurses, we send them out to rural towns and, and remote areas. There's, you know, a really big push on their, on their resumes that if they've got uh, overseas travel or volunteer work, that's all a plus. Politicians... Just be white and a man, you know? And um, <laughs> But I actually had a question. So, for, for you, you asked the question. Can I ask how old you are? I'm 18. Yeah, so your peers, are a lot of your peers interested in politics? 
Um, I'd be the most interested out of my peers. Because your question is, is, is super politically savvy, like you're really taking note of what's happening, but people like the, the generation just under me, I've noticed are the most politically savvy. This is the most politically in touch society I've ever seen. And yet they have no interest in politics, mm. which tells you everything mm. about our politicians. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? I blame mean? TikTok. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it can't just be TikTok. A large majority of Australia's religious population uh, are immigrant communities. And they asked today, who should we vote for? And part of that is the Muslim community that I come from. Should we vote for the Liberal Party, who share a lot of our stances on issues of morality and traditional family? but at the same time, you know, don't have the best history when it comes to accepting immigrants and issues of racism? Or should they vote for the Labour Party, uh, who are generally more accepting of immigrants and have progressiveness in, in that area, but especially in the last decade, have shown a serious lack of connection in, to some extent when it comes to um, religious or moral uh, values and traditional moral values. So those religious communities ask, who should they vote for today? Claire O'Neill, I'll start with you, because mm -hmm. Bakar's question indicates that there's a, uh, a real lack of belief in you as a party anymore, and that's an interesting point you make about the last couple of decades, having lost touch with any um, sense of religion or faith. Mm. The ALP certainly had that, and of course we don't need to go back to the split in the DLP. But if that impression is landing, then you lose that audience. Yeah. Um, Bakar, I hope that... Um I, I, don't, I don't believe that's an accurate reflection of Labor, but, you know, you're a voter and you get to make your own assessment of the political parties. Um, but I do hear this a little bit from religious people and I just went through a big discussion with a lot of my mm. um, faith communities around the Religious Discrimination Act that just went through the parliament. And I did feel that I had to go to real pains to explain to them that there are actually a lot of religious MPs within the Labor Party that we have enormous respect for faith communities. And we do, do have can I, to... Can I just jump in? Do, yeah. do, those, do those religious MPs, do they feel within the Labor Party that they're able to express their faith as obviously and volubly yeah. as, say, the Prime Minister does? Yeah, I, I do believe that they do. But, they, but fact, they don't seem to? And, in fact, the discussions that I have with religious MPs in the Labor Party, like I'm from a Christian background... You know, my view is that, you know, the teachings of Christ are actually traditional Labor teachings because this is about sharing with the community, about bringing people together. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where I come from. But, yeah, there are lots of religious people in the Labor Party. We've got two um, Islamic MPs um, as well as, you know, other religions that are represented. So, I mean, the Religious Discrimination Act, I think, was an important moment for the Labor Party where we fought really hard to make sure that people who have a religious faith in this country were better protected by the laws of Australia. Um, what we saw in that instance was, in fact, the government you know, vote against its own bill to stop religious discrimination being prohibited in a proper way in this country. Um, so I think we've got some work to do with yourself and with other religious people around the country to give you confidence that Labor understands you. You know, I represent a really religious community and I take that really, really seriously. Mm. A lot of migrants um, and many other people indeed okay. in my community are religious and it's, it's really important that we represent you faithfully. Let's move on to Anne Rustin because, of course, you called out there in that question as well, your party, about having, I think the phrase you used, Bakar, was a history of, of racism. Well, I, I would certainly um, say to Becca, I'm sorry that you think that way because I don't believe that we have a history of racism. Um, I think that, you know, we are a great multicultural nation and, you know, all political parties, I think, respect that multiculturalism um, and particularly respect the faith um, of many different faiths in Australia uh, and their right to, to be able to, to worship those faiths. And I think that is tremendously important. A little disappointing, Claire, that you're choosing to rewrite the truth around the history of the Religious Discrimination Bill. Um, you know, we were very keen to make sure that the rights of people of faith were protected and their rights to be able to, to um, actually worship that faith in a way uh, that, that responded to the tenets of that faith were terribly important. Um, and to suggest otherwise, I think, is a little disingenuous. But, back, I just want to say to you, absolutely committed to, to allowing all Australians 
of free faith to be able to practice that faith. Uh, but I think one of the more important things, or, or a very important thing as well, that you need to look at is around, um, you know, the, the plan for our economy, the plan for our Australia into the future, so that you are able to have the freedoms that obviously you so want uh, to be able to practice your faith and so many other things that you'd we'll, like we'll to get, do. We'll get to life. those issues, but the question, of course, went to, to faith and that clearly matters to you. But on that issue of the, the issues with immigration and racism that Baka uh, mentions there, so we, we now actually have, just in the last few hours, the eight remaining refugees and asylum seekers that have been held at the Park Hotel in Melbourne that for up to nine years have just been released. And uh, another 12 asylum seekers have also been released from detention in other cities as well. Uh, they've been there for nine years in this case and uh, different years in other cases, but a, a staggering amount of time and a staggering amount of money has been spent on offshore processing, uh, approaching $6 billion since 2013. What were all those nine years about, Anne Rustin? They were supposed to be security threats. How come they're just released onto the streets now? Well, one of the very strong things that we believe in as a coalition government, and that is the, the, the uh, security of our borders uh, and making sure that by having secure borders that we are able to have immigration policies that allow us to be able to have humanitarian intakes. And so, you know, we make no apology for the things that we did to stop those boats coming to Australia I'm, I'm, stopping I'm, I'm people sorry, I'm from sorry being to jump killed. in, Anne, but I, I'm going to take you to my question, which was about they were held there because they were apparently not able to be released in the community, they are a security risk. What's changed in nine years and millions, if not billions of dollars later, that they're suddenly released on the eve of an election? Well, obviously, decisions in relation to national security uh, are a matter for the Minister for Home Affairs. But what I would repeat again, and that is that the national security of this country is built on strong borders, and we make no apology for the fact that we will continue to keep our borders safe. So this, this, uh, won't, this won't start the boats again then? I mean, that was always the rhetoric, that if you let them out into the community, the boats would start again. So they'll start again? Well, I think one of the things that we do need to be very careful of going into, um, you know, to make, when we make our decision about the, the election, um, is do we want to have a government that has a policy, a strong border policy that says we will do things to stop border sta uh, boats starting You're still starting not again? answering my question, Anne Rustin. Will it start the boats again? Well, any, uh, I, what I'm saying to you is that the strong border policies of the government of which I am a minister have seen the cessation of those death boats that saw thousands of people uh, drowned at sea and we make no apology for that policy. I know everyone wants to jump in but Buckeye, is there anything you want to add in here? No, I'm just going to say that it, it's shocking and ridiculous that it took this long to take them. You know, every moment of a human being's life mm. is valuable and them being locked up for nine years, that's just, those are fellow human beings, their lives are lost. I don't know how old they were but I, I imagine I couldn't stay in there for five minutes so yeah. I don't know why it took nine years to then release them. Uh, we did... This evening with the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre uh, to establish just in what state the detainees are in. And we were told that they're, they're deeply traumatised uh, and they're being sent out with a small, rather small sum of money, about $300, I understand, and uh, enough money, accommodation for three weeks. What happens next, we're not sure about. But I know you wanted to jump in there, Steph. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, one glaring thing is um, the, the messaging of boat people is so dehumanising, just on a human level, that is awful. I cannot believe you brought it up. I feel like that was already talked about. Like, what an awful thing to call a human being as a boat person. Um, especially when, you, you know, you, you keep in mind that a lot of people who are coming to this country are coming in on planes, you know what I mean? But, but for you to sit there on a national program and say boat people... And then, of course, there's the other thing of, yeah, you know, Australian security, Australian security. What about the First Nations people of this country? Because that's what I want to know. There's a... I mean, you're talking about, about policy and writing policy that, that tightens our borders, and we've been pushing for a treaty for a very, very, very long time. And we... Like, I'm, I, I truly believe that this is kind of one of those things where this kind of happens in the, in the background, and this is what our leaders need to do. Our leaders need to make decisions. If they're decisions that people are going to be upset about, then at least own up to it. You're talking in circles and not saying anything of of w okay. answering the questions. It's just frustrating. Do you think that it is fair and acceptable that a disability support pension or aged pension recipient who cannot work is expected to live below the poverty line simply because they are injured or ill? That they should daily choose whether to keep a roof over their head or eat 
or by medicine. The proper quality dental work is forever an unobtainable dream. Why are the people who cannot work treated as though they won't work? Before we, before we get to the politicians, Gideon, I'll, I'll start with you. I'm sure you saw what the, uh, the Prime yeah. Minister copped uh, in the pub last night uh, in, uh, just yeah, outside of Newcastle. And it, was just, it was along a similar line, saying that he's worked and he's worked. Why is he left in this position? Yeah, and look, I have been in favour for a long time of raising the rate. Uh, a lot of politicians will skirt around the question, uh, you know, more so talking about things like New Start. Could you live on it? They won't answer. Look, I'll be the first to admit I could never live on what we pay New Start recipients. Not in a million years. Uh, it is not enough to live on and it's certainly not enough to find a new job on, uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, but... It, there is a proviso and there is a, a, a caveat, which is we have to find a way to help the long-term unemployed get into the workforce. There are too many barriers and too many obstacles to prevent that from happening. We do not want to just keep raising the rate and raising the rate and raising the weight without giving people the opportunity for rewarding, productive, uh, socially inclusive work. I, um, I'll ask Anne Rustin about this as well, but Gideon, while I've got you, the issue of, because we've got such a, a workforce shortage at the moment mm. and such a shortage of labour, you've got a lot of people on the aged care pension, for example, who would like to be able to work a bit yeah. without having it, their, their pension hacked and in particular their spouse's pension cut because they've worked a few hours shifts during the week. Is there an argument for doing that? I think there's an argument for, flex for flexibility. I think there's an argument for allowing, uh, for example, some people on Ustart to work uh, as well while retaining their benefits as well. It, it, it's about getting into the workforce because we, we, studies show us that if you've been unemployed for a, a, more than a year, you are 25% less likely to find a job. After two years, your chances drop dramatically still. Uh, we cannot keep leaving people behind and leaving them out of the economy uh, and letting them uh, languish on payments that are clearly not uh, good enough and not enough to sustain a dignified life on. Steph, what did you think of Michael's question? Oh, I was on the dole for ages. Well, not for ages, but for a while. Um, and what was that like? It was really tough. Like, I, and I mean, it's actually so much. Uh, there's so many things that are attached to it. I mean, the the socioeconomic bracket that is sort of that socioeconomic bracket are also more likely to uh, do things like smoke and drink like we have these stats that show this stuff yeah. and they're the most highly taxed thing i mean it's absolutely yeah. crazy <laughs> to right. me yeah. we tax the poorest people in this country um and it's because you know i think governments in general like um advantage from inequity but it's it's like especially when it comes to disability payments i mean i cannot believe the 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 backlash that happened. I remember having a, a conversation with a friend of mine uh, during when, when New Start happened. She lost her job. She got onto it and she was like, is this what people are honestly living off? And it's like the story, the message that we've been sold is that people who are, who are on the dole don't want to work. There is no reward for working. It is, mm. you are worse off mm. if you're working a couple of hours a week than you are to just stay on the dole and mm. kind of you know, figure out your life on that. There's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's so, so, so hard. That added thing of, 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 of disability payments, I can't even imagine that with the extra medical and hospital costs, it, it's astonishing. Uh, Claire, and not to put you under too much pressure, but if you can try and keep your answers brief, because the election's not quite called yet, and there's some other questions we'd like to get to. But it, it, the, Michael's question, Anne Rustin, was that do you think it's fair and acceptable? about the situation that people on their disability, disability support pension are on. Surely, as a, as a fellow human being, you, you can't answer that it is. Well, there, there were a number of things that have been unpacked in the conversations that we've just had following the, the question. Um, the first thing I would say in relation to the disability support pension, it is paid at a significantly higher rate than, than um, the, what we would refer to as unemployment benefits or job seeker, because it recognises that, that people um, who aren't able to work um, will need a, a higher amount of money to live on because we're not expecting them to go out and work. But the other thing I'd say, there are a number of things that have, have been put in place. I mean, the end NDIS. I commend the NDIS. It was game changing in so many mm. people's lives who are, who are on, who have lived with disability. And you've committed to the... fully fund it. We have committed to fully fund it, and it will be fully funded. But also, just um, recently in the uh, in the budget, we uh, we reduced the threshold in relation to um, concession card holders to be able to get access to um, to drugs sooner and to be able to get free free medicines sooner by reducing the threshold. Um, but the other thing in, in relation to comments around the age pension and age pensioners working, age pensioners who are listening should know that they can earn up to 
uh, $300 a fortnight um, accumulated, so that's $7,800 a year before one cent of their pension is touched. Okay, well, look, I, that... I've got to jump in now because it does sound like you're actually saying to Michael, look, it is enough, we've done enough. Seth, you were just um, guffawing there. Do you want to just quickly vocalise that and I'll move on to Claire? Oh, they're allowed to make 300 bucks in a fortnight? That's... That's insane. That's I, that was all. I was just laughing. <laughs> okay, right. I had nothing more to say. I was just like, wow. Well, Claire, what would the Labor Party do? Well, I do think it's really tough, and I don't think you can hear a question like that and not feel, um, you know, the sense of emotion behind that. Um, I think one of the but things... It's about what you'd be prepared to fully fund yeah, in terms of so, the increase. So one of the things I'd just say is I think that times like we're in at the moment where the cost of living is increasing make this time particularly hard for people who are on a fixed income. So suddenly the cost of everything's going up but their fixed income doesn't mm. go up at the same rate. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that Labor wants to do to provide cost of living relief to Australians that would affect the gentleman that asked the question. Um, but I just want to go back to the NDIS. I think we were living in a country before where people who had a disability were pretty much excluded from society, no real capacity to work and to train, and that has been changed, and I'm really proud of that reform. I, I just want to really quickly, very quickly, if I can, from both of you, Claire O'Neill and Rustin, I hear constantly on my radio program from family, from family members, parents, who are calling in to say, my child, with, for example, and it often usually is, autism, and associated conditions that go with that a situation or a condition that's really not going to change much over the years. But there are lots of scaffolding and supports that can be put in place and social connections as well. Being told they've had their amount offered that they had by the NDIS cut in half. Why? Because the NDIA has decided that those supports aren't value for money anymore which is probably one of the most absurd things you'll ever hear about a condition that's going to be lifelong. Can you make a commitment this evening that we're not going to hear those sorts of reports anymore from parents about a sudden 50% cut yeah. in a program? Yeah. So, I mean, I think... Very that, quickly, Claire. Yeah, I think that's been really disturbing and you would have heard Bill Shorten talking about this a lot. Um, we're quickly. really worried about the cuts that the government has made to the NDIS. What's your, what's your undertaking? And this is something that we don't want to see more of. I mean, I can't absolutely commit that in the future no one will ever have their program cut, but I can say this has been really disturbing to us because the NDIS is meant to be okay. a needs-based program. What you need is what gets funded. And Rustin, do you have a commitment for us? Well, absolutely. If anybody from the NDIS is telling somebody that they can't have a program because it's not value for money, I'd like to know who they are because I think that's an outrageous statement. It's all the time. Um, but, um, you know, we are committed to fully funding the, the NDIS and we will do so into the future because we believe it is a, it is a great program that is able to support so many Australians who've lived with disability. Um, but, you know, that, that is an, an unacceptable thing for somebody to be told. Uh, we are not cutting the NDIS. We will continue to fully fund it. Uh, and I would hope that anybody from the NDIS would not be suggesting um, that somebody's program or package was not um, being given to them because it wasn't value for money. And that's all we have time for. Please thank our terrific panel this evening. Steph Tisdall, Claire O'Neill, Gideon Rosner, Samantha Maiden and Anne Rustin. <laughs> You've all been fantastic, thank you. Really good. And thanks for your questions and thank you to you at home as well for watching. Next week, Stan Grant will join you live from Sydney and you can join me on Mornings tomorrow on ABC Melbourne. I hope you'll get up nice and early and do that. Until then, good night. Go away.